you're rolling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my name is Mike Furman. Uh, this is a uh, sample video on some of the presentations that are one of the presentations that I do for high school students. Uh, this one's particular is this particular presentation is called Life After High School. It's a little bit about the importance of secondary education, uh, and then kind of gets into a little bit about motivation and life success and uh, steps to be successful in overcoming um, obstacles that come our way. So. Uh, we're going to go, as we run this presentation, uh, we're going to do it as if I was in front of a group of high school students, so I'll be talking to a make-believe crowd of people that aren't here. Uh, I may even have some times where I turn it over to the crowd and pretend that there's an, uh, a response given, uh, and uh, yeah, we'll kind of go from there. So this is a sample of kind of what we do. So uh, with that said, uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about life after high school, uh, success after high school. Before we get into that, uh, I want to let you know that there is a... Maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't know, but, but there is a trap that's waiting for you when you graduate from high school. If you were to graduate tomorrow, in fact, uh, well, let me ask you this question. How's the economy right now? How's the economy? Yeah, not, not the greatest, right? Hopefully it's getting better. They tell us it's getting better. should be getting better, but uh, hasn't been the greatest for a while. Um, even as bad as the economy is, though, if you were to graduate tomorrow, you could still, even in this area, in this, in this, in this economy, find a job... Uh, right out of high school, making $10, 12 dollars an hour right off the bat. Now it won't be your, you know, a dream job, more likely to be a factory job. But if you wanted it, and if you had to do it, you could fairly easily find a job making $10, 12 dollars an hour right out of high school. And what happens to a lot of people is they graduate from high school and they land one of these jobs. And this begins to be kind of the first step as they this, they fall into this trap and and it's waiting for you. It's been around for a long time. Uh, so. You're making a job, you got this job, you're making 10, 12 dollars an hour, which when, you, when you're single, that, that pays for a lot of stuff, right? 12 dollars an hour plus overtime, that'll get you your own place, still leave enough money over for, left over for your own vehicle, uh, partying on the weekends and maybe an Xbox or a snowmobile, I don't know, whatever it is that you want to buy. Uh, and uh, what happens again is, is a lot of people graduate from high school, they get one of these jobs, and then when somebody comes up to them and says, hey, uh, weren't you planning to go to high school? Why don't you quit that job you're working at and go work part-time at Wendy's so that you can have time to go to school like you said you're going to and get your degree. And the response is either, well, I don't really want to because, you know, uh, I got a great job. Or I can't because I just bought this gigantic pickup truck with a 6-inch lift and 22-inch rims and, and, you know, now i got to make payments. So they say, okay, well, why don't you go work, uh, why don't you go work a swing, right? You can still keep your factory job you make lots of money and work swing shift. Uh, then you can go to school during the day and then work at night and the response is, ah. Uh, yeah, but that's hard. I mean, swing, work school all day and work all night. Besides, swing shift, that cuts into my party time. And besides, why? I got this great job. The money's rolling in. I lucked out. I got out of high school. I got this fantastic job, and life is great. What's the problem? Is there a problem? Well, yeah, there is a little bit. The problem is, sometimes when we're young, especially, it happens to everybody, but especially, particularly when we're young, we tend to get all caught up in the now. Right? Everything's about right now. I didn't pass the test right now. I got, didn't get my driver's license right now. Somebody dumped me right now. The world's going to come to an end, right? Really? You're worried about a relationship that went south in high school? Really? Do you know how many hot people are going to meet me now at age 25? Do you know what they... Anyway, talk to a guy to get married to his 34, so I'll take it with a grain of salt. But the point is this. <laughs> Life is going to go on, right? Life will continue to roll on, and what... Happens to most people, and not everybody, it happened to me quite this fast, but most people, within five to ten years after you graduate high school, what happens is you do, in fact, meet somebody special. And you fall in love. And you get married, right? Now, don't tell my wife I put her wedding pictures on the the trap. Because it, marriage is not the trap. Okay? Marriage is great. Marriage is wonderful. <laughs> but, despite what some people will tell you, marriage, life doesn't end after you're married, right? In fact, in my opinion, life gets a lot better. Uh, but what happens, again, not everybody, but a lot of people, within five to six years after you get married, what comes along? Kids. Right, kids. Oh, and kids are great, and kids are wonderful, and kids are so cute, but kids are expensive. Oh, my. You wait till half your paycheck goes to die. And you know what? Kids are expensive when they're healthy. Okay? When they're healthy, they're expensive. You wait till they get sick. This, 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 this little bugger right here, not too long ago, had pneumonia, went down to the primary children's hospital for two weeks. I'm going to be paying on that bill. For the next 10 years of my life if I'm lucky okay kids are expensive now what happens though is that job we were talking about that was so great when you were single making 10 12 dollars an hour most of those jobs will max out at about 14. what I mean by that is you can work that job the rest of your life and you'll never make more than 14 15 dollars an hour that job 
And even though 10 to 12 dollars an hour was fantastic when you were single, 14 to 15 when you have a spouse and kids involved, doesn't come close. It doesn't come close. But the problem is, again, if you've fallen into the scenario that we're talking about, is that you haven't done one thing to make, you more, make yourself more marketable as an employee since the day you left high school. And in fact, what you find out really quickly is you're worth the same amount 10 years after you graduated high school as you were the day you walked out the door. You haven't done one thing to make floors want to pay you more money. And what you suddenly find is you paint yourself into a corner. Okay? Because you don't have the fun, you don't have the money right now to take care of the people that you, you know, in the job that you're at, but you also don't have the means to step up or step out. Not that life is all about money. We're going to talk about that. Life isn't all about money. But what you find out real quickly is life is all about taking care of the people that you love and the people that you care about. And, and obviously money is how you do that. And, and again, if you fall into the scenario, here comes in the trap. Because you can't stay where you are, but you also don't have the means to step up and go or step out and go someplace else and make, make the salary that you need to. Okay? Now, sometimes I put this picture up here and somebody will raise their hand and say, well, you know, there's a window right there. And, okay, you're right, there's a window. It's not hopeless. In fact, our night class at Stevens Hanger College right now, they're a chuck full of people in this exact boat. Okay, they're in their late 30, 20s, early 30s, and basically their life consists of the following. They wake up about 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, take their kids to school, or to doctor's appointments, school, whatever, babysitters, bounce them off where they need to, and then they go to work. And then they're at work till about 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, then they go home, get kids, bounce them off babysitters, doctor's appointments, take care of the things they need to, try to grab a quick bite to eat, and then they come to school. Then they're at school from 6 o'clock to about 10 o'clock at night. And then at 10 o'clock at night, they go home, grab the kids, babysitters, take, take care of their family, and do their homework. And most of them average about four hours sleep a night. And luckily for them, we go Monday through Thursday, so they have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they catch up on their sleep. Also, luckily for them, we go, you know, we get their four-year degree in three years, which takes most people six, we can get done in three. But still, even for them, they're looking for the next three years of life, get four hours sleep most likely. And my point is this. School is a million times easier to do when you're younger and when you're single and when it's just you that you have to worry about versus later on when you have a spouse and kids and everything else that you have to juggle with in your life. My first piece of advice to you then is you said you were going to go to college. I, asked, I just asked you guys a few minutes ago, as, how many of you guys are planning to go to college? Every single person that I saw here raised their hand. So you said you were going to go to college. Go and go as fast as you possibly can. It is a million times easier to do now versus later on. The sooner you get it done, the sooner you can get on with your life. Okay, that's my first piece of advice. Said you're going to go to college, go and go as fast as you can. All right. Let's talk about dropout rates for a minute in college. Anybody know what percentage is, what college dropout rates are? Blah, guess, 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 guess. Okay, we have a bunch of guesses. Actually, uh, nationally, uh, dropout rates are... Uh, no, dropout, rates. <laughs> dropout rates nationally uh, are, are uh, 90, 80%. 80% nationally. So 80% of you who raise your hand and said you're going to go to college, nationally speaking, are going to drop out. Only 20% of you will finish. Now, the state of Utah does a little bit better. The state of Utah is sitting about 60%. High 50s, low 60s is about the percentage where we sit uh, that, that drop out, right? So even for you guys, in this, you know, statistically speaking, the state of Utah, 60% of you are going to drop out of college. My question is, um, why do people drop out? What's the reason? Then we got to go the rounds. People are going to ask hands questions. You usually have a student who raise their hand and say it's because it's hard. Um, and which I'll usually respond hard. You know what? I used to think college was hard. That, that's, that's when I heard that statistic. That's what I thought first, too. Sure, college is so hard because, oh my gosh, college is so. You know what? I'm going to tell you a lot of things today that will scare you. I'll tell you one thing and make you feel a little bit better. Okay, college, is, college isn't easy, but it's not overly hard either. Okay, it's a natural step in your educational process. It's not like you start out as a, as a freshman in high school, then you go become a sophomore, then you become a junior, then you become a senior, and then suddenly, whoa, college freshman, way hard. Yeah, that, that doesn't happen. It's a natural step in the process. And in fact, one of the things we like to tell people, you don't have to be a genius to graduate from college, but it does require a lot of effort uh, and dedication. Those are the things that make the difference. It's not that it's overly hard, a lot of people are dropping out. Okay, there are life changes. Life changes come up, people get married, people move away, things like that, but it's still not the biggest reason. Far and away, the biggest reason why so many people drop out of college has to do with the difference between high school life and college life. See, right now, if you decided tomorrow, say it's 7.30 and you're still laying in bed, and you think to yourself, I ain't going to school. And you just stayed in bed. What would happen to you at your house? If it was anything like my house growing up. Yeah, 
Mom and dad could come down, they're going to freak out, get mad. My dad used to grab me by the legs and just yank me out on the floor, right? One minute I'd be laying in bed, the next minute I'm on the floor going, oh, I was in bed. You know, mom would come down with a bucket of water, whatever. But generally, parents tend to freak out in most cases, right? Well, it's a school do if you don't call, show up. Your son or daughter was tardy or absent today, blah, 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 and your parents get a phone call, right? You go long enough without going to school, eventually, you know, truancy officers and uh, CPI, yeah, anyway, the cops are going to show up and want to know where you are, too, right? It's because you're under 18, you have no rights. So, okay, you have some rights. It's property of your parents. You have, you know, it's on the tax forms, you can see. Uh, but anyway, point is, right now, if you don't go to college, if you don't go to school, the whole world freaks out, right? When you graduate and you move out and you're living with your buddies or whatever in, in the party house or whatever, and you wake up the next morning and decide not to go to college, what happens? Nothing. Nothing? Really? You mean Utah State, Weber State, they don't call up your parents and say, your son or daughter not come to college today? Nope. No. Okay. Nobody cares. It's your dime, right? You pay for it. You can go. You can not. In fact, you can go ahead, go ahead and flunk. Because now you just have to pay to take, take the class twice. That's more money in their pocket. College doesn't care. And in fact, you should understand this truth about college. Not only do a lot of your college professors not care about you, a lot of them don't even like you. See, you don't become a college professor because you want to change the youth of America. That's what high school teachers do, right? That's high school teachers' job. College professors become college professors because they they want to do their research. They're developing the next artificial heart, or shooting lasers into space, or writing their books, you know, or whatever they're doing. Oh, and on the side, if they want to get the grant money, you got to teach this stupid class, and and that's how they treat you. And they come in and go stand up on the podium and open their textbook and go, blah, 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 blah. Test takes Wednesday, 8 o'clock, don't be late, I'm locking the door. And they do. And if you show up at 8 o'clock in two minutes, door's locked, you're not getting in, you can pound, scream, holler. It's fun to watch from the inside, right? Uh, those call security and have you go out. Uh, and if that happens to you, and uh, you showed up, you just flunked the test because you showed up two minutes late for your test, hopefully it's not one of those classes of which I took plenty where the only points for the whole semester were the midterm and the final. And if it was one of those classes, and you just flunked your midterm because you showed up two minutes late, there's no sense even going to class the whole rest of the term, because you can't make up that. That's not, you just flunked the class. And if that just happened to you, and you just flunked your midterm in a class, basically just flunked the class, hopefully it's not one of those classes that they only offer one time a year, because there's plenty of those. Because now you got to wait until next year to even take the class, and you're starting to see why a lot of times it can take people anywhere from six to eight years to get a four-year degree, uh, just because of things that come up and go along. Uh, but... Uh, Basically, if, if you look at that 60%, though, in the state of Utah, 80% nationally, they all had a dream. They all sat in a class when some crazy guy came and said, hey, you plan to go to college? You know, they all raised their hand. They all had a dream of what they want to do, where they want to go with their life. And their dream, though, went down the toilet for no better reason than once they were living on their own, they weren't self-motivated, self-disciplined enough to get their own behind out of bed and get to class. Because okay, mm -hmm. nobody's going to do it for you anymore. Okay, that's what it's, it's got to be you who does that. Your roommate's not going to stand over you with a bucket of water and say, come on, dude, you got to get to class. Okay? College, like most things in life, 90% of it is showing up. If you show up, you got a shot. If you don't, there's no way. Now, that makes a lot of sense right now, right? Sitting here in class, you go, oh, yeah, okay, you got to show up. But trust me, okay, having done it, when you've been out partying until 2 or 3 in the morning, it becomes really easy to start rationalizing with yourself. Oh, I can miss today. I mean, I missed twice this week, three times last week, but I'll be okay. No, you won't, okay? At least for these few years, you've got to buckle down, do what it takes to get yourself up out of class, get you behind the class. Once you become an adult, there's no one else there to make you do it, okay? My first piece of advice was go to college and go as soon as you possibly can, right? My second piece of advice is when you go, you have got to go to class. Do what it takes to make this a priority so that you can get to class every single day, all right? Okay. Oh... Real quickly, sometimes I don't spend a lot of time talking about this slide, depending on how much time I got in the classroom, but what, what this slide is basically about is, is sometimes when I sit down, I've sat down with college students and their parents, I mean prospective college students, high school graduates and their parents, and I sit down and interview with them, and I talk to them about college, going to school, and they'll, and they'll say, hey Mike, just so you know, if I have to go into debt to do this, if this is take out a loan, this is not going to happen. Okay, I'm, 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 if I have to take out a loan and go into debt and go to school, then, then, then this, is just, this isn't going to be, and I'm not going to go to school. To which I usually reply, okay, that's great. I understand why you're saying that. You know what? Everybody knows that loans stink. Nobody wants to go into debt, and I, and I, and I think you're very admirable for not wanting to go into debt. In fact, most of the country the problems that this country came into were because people went into too much debt they couldn't afford. But my question to you then is this. If you were planning to not go into debt, how were you planning to pay for school? 
you have a big scholarship or something that you had? Were you, you got some money saved up? Was, you got a rich uncle? Pop, and some, well, how are you planning to play for school? And, and, and I have only one time, and all the time I've talked to people, I had somebody said, yep, well, I've got the money set aside, and I'm going to pay for it. Every other time I've had parents and students kind of look down and go, well, I don't really know. And so then I have this conversation with them. Okay? And we basically talk about this and, and say, okay, look, and I'll ask you guys this question. Which one of these is the better buy? The house for 260000 or the Tahoe for 45000 Which one of those is the better buy? The house. The house? Why do you say, well, how many people say the house? How many people say Tahoe? Anybody say Tahoe? You guys say Tahoe. Why is Tahoe a better buy? And usually you get things like, well, it's cheaper. Well, you can live in the Tahoe if you really need to or whatever. And, and I don't want to, don't give me the answer I think you're going to give me. Give me a high school kid answer. Why do you think the house is a better buy? Let me tell you what high school kids normally say. Is they'll say, well, because you can live in it. And, you know, you can do more with it. And it provides a sanctuary and so forth, which is all true, okay? But that's actually not the main reason why this is a better buy, which is probably what you were going to say, which is... House increases in value, car decreases in value. The second I bought this Tahoe, if I tried to sell it the very next day, I could maybe get 42 out of it. Okay? The house, my parents bought their home in 19... Or sorry, uh, yeah, they bought their home in 1971. And at that time, they paid $22,000 for their home. And everybody said, $22,000? <laughs> Are you crazy? You're going into debt for $22,000? And they did. And they took out a loan for $22,000 for their home. They still live in the same home today. They've long since paid that debt off. But their home today is now worth about $250,000. Was that a good idea for them to go into debt for that home? Yes. Absolutely. Even if for the last 43, 44 years, all they've done was pay interest, it still would be a good investment because they could still sell it and get out of it and be way ahead, right? There are two things in life where I think that's the case, usually. One is a home. Now, for a while, homes got a little bit scary there. Um, but, but generally, homes increase in value. The other thing that I would say is a good idea to go in debt for. Yes, you want to stay out there as much as you possibly can, but there are two times when it's a good idea. One is the home, and the second is an education. The average person makes somewhere between a million and 2.3 million more dollars in their lifetime with a college degree, with a bachelor's degree, versus a high school diploma. So is it worth it to go into 20, 30, 40, even, and, I, and I, I'm not saying to do this, but technically speaking, even a $150,000 debt for school, would that be worth it? Yes. Generally, yes, because you're going to make millions, right? Now, again, be reasonable. You don't buy a house you can't afford, and you try to, you know, don't get a, you know, have your debt go through the roof and have $250,000 for a bachelor's degree. Sure. You know, be reasonable about it uh, and keep it as low as you can, but, but just understand that in, in today's world, 90% of college students today have some type of, of loan that they have to pay off when they graduate. It's just kind of become the way it is, and college has become an investment that we have to do. Um, don't let loans scare you away from going to school. What I'm really trying to get across to you guys today, uh, prim primarily, is that there is absolutely no reason, if you want a college degree or you know, if you want a, a, uh, a bachelor's degree, that you can't have one. I have friends who told me, I'm going to stop college material. And man, I hate that phrase. I'm not even sure I totally know what that means. I guess maybe what they were saying is, I just don't have the study skills, right, to go to school. If that's the case, well, you can fix that. There's no such thing as college material or not college material. If, other than, if what you want to do in life requires a college education, then you're college material. And, and somewhere there is a, there's a place that can help you with that. There are some schools out there that not even now, you've got to be careful when I tell you this, because grades are important and grades definitely matter. And you want to get the best possible grades you can out of high school. But if for some reason you tanked your grades when you're a sophomore, sophomore uh, and your GPA is not quite where you want it to be, that doesn't mean you still doesn't mean you can't get a college education. There are colleges out there who will still take you as long as you're willing to work hard now. I work for one of them. Okay. Uh, there is no reason why you can't get a college education if you, if you want it or if you need it for what you want to do in life. I don't know if you knew this not, the college numbers are declining. In fact, uh, not too long ago, Harvard did a study, and they found that uh, your generation will be the first generation in the history of this country who will be less educated than the previous generation. How does that make you feel? Since 1776, every rising generation has become better educated than the previous generation until now, and for the first time ever, your generation will be less educated than the previous one. How does that make you feel? You know what? If I were you... And somebody told me that, I think that was the best news I heard all week. I would think that was fantastic news. 
Because what I essentially just told you is when you graduate, there will be fewer graduates out there than there was when your parents graduated. Which means you will be in higher demand than your parents were in, in that generation when they graduated. Which should generally gener turn into increased salary based, you know, percentage-wise based upon what your parents' generation faced. In my opinion, there has never been a greater reason or a higher incentive to go to college than there is right now. Okay? Yeah, it's kind of scary for the country, you know, whatever, but for you personally, because I just asked you guys, all how time do you plan to go to college? Every single one of you raised your hand, so every single one of you should be saying, this is fantastic news, because when I graduate, I will be better off. Right? Okay. Uh, let's talk about something else for a minute. Let's shift gears a little bit. I want everybody in here to close your eyes. Now, I know, I know, it's going to be dumb. Just, just, just bear with me. Just do it, okay? Close your eyes. And what I want you to do is imagine, uh, with your eyes closed, that you've just floated outside your body. Leave your body behind. Float up to the back corner of the room. And from the back corner of the room, look down at yourself, sitting there in your chair from that angle. Analyze your posture. Look at what you're wearing. It's funny how many people straighten when I say analyze your posture. Uh, look at what your hair looks like from the back. I don't know, whatever. See yourself sitting there in your chair, right? Now that you've done that, I want you to take a second and analyze your thoughts, your emotions. What are you thinking right now? You might be thinking this is the dumbest thing you've ever done. That's okay. Okay, you can think it. All right, go ahead, go, go ahead and look your eyes. This little dumb thing that we did, as silly and as dumb as it was, you could not do were it not for the fact that as a human being, you are self-aware, which is actually fairly unique on this planet. Not very many animals are self-aware. For the longest time, we used to think that human beings were the only animals that were self-aware. Turns out we were wrong. There are a few others, but not very many. Uh, it's fairly unique on this planet to have an animal living here who is self-aware. What we mean when we say you're self-aware is that you are more than your thoughts and your emotions. There's more to you than that, right? The fact that you can think about... When, you think, when you're in a bad mood, you don't walk down the hall going, Arr! and somebody says, hi, you punch him in the face because you're a mad guy right now. You know, at least, at least not. I hope you don't. Right? You might want to, maybe, even, but generally you go... Because you know that you're still you, you're just in a bad mood because it's Monday, you know, or whatever, right? Same thing when you're in a happy mood, you know, you just walk around, ah, happy, happy, and somebody punches you and you don't care because I'm a happy guy, you know, whatever. You know you're still you, but you're just, you know, in a good mood or whatever that time. The fact that you can think about your thoughts means there's more to you than just those thoughts. Just like you can analyze your hand or your arm means there's more to you than your hand or your arm. When you can say to yourself, well, I'm in a really bad mood today. Hmm. That means there's more to you than that mood or that thought, if that makes sense. Okay, that's kind of what we're talking about when we say you're self-aware. You weren't born that way, okay? You've been self-aware for a long time, uh, but you weren't born self-aware. Uh, in fact, there's a really easy, uh, there's a really easy test you can do. Maybe got younger brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews that are babies. You, you want to experiment on them, okay? Really easy experiment you can do uh, if you want to test to see if the baby's self-aware. All right. Basically, what you do is take the baby, you hold them up, you get a really sharp knife. Just gonna let me go with this? <laughs> really? No, no, no. Put the knife down. Okay, keep all the sharp objects away. Don't even, while the baby's playing safely, all right, come up to them, get a little sticker, some kind of whatever, stick it on the baby's forehead. Then wait a second until they've forgotten what you've done. And then take the baby and hold them up in front of the mirror. The moment that you hold the baby in front of the mirror and they look at themselves and they go, and, and pull the sticker off their head, you know they become self-aware because they get it. They understand that I'm this human being who occupies space and time in this universe, and that's me, and there's something in my head, you know, whatever. Uh, usually happens around the age two, okay? My, uh, my oldest is in that picture. That was, that was quite a while ago when he was like three, very self-aware. My youngest, who's, who's become self-aware since, but I remember, uh, you know, well, and all my boys, when they were not self-aware, you would put them in front of a the mirror. They loved the mirror, right? They'd talk themselves, put their fingerprints all over it, blah, 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 lick it, whatever. No idea who that kid was. In fact, uh, my youngest one time, we were walking through the mall, and he saw himself, he was kind of booting along there, and he saw himself in one of those full-length mirrors in the mall, and he got all excited and came running up to the mirror and gave himself a kiss, because he loved that kid. He always there to play with him, always does what he had no idea who he was, right? Usually happens around the age of two. Okay, that you become self-aware, you start to understand who you are. Uh, the reason why this matters, okay, I want to bring it up, is because even though you never really think about it, being self-aware is a very powerful thing about you. It's what allows you to learn. It's what allows you to change things about yourself, fix things about yourself. It's what allows you to improve. So you can't improve unless you first know what it is that's wrong that you want to make better. You have to first be able to, you can't learn something new until you first know what it is you don't know. It's kind of the first step, right? You have to first be able to analyze yourself and say, well, I don't know geometry. I better go take a class. OK? 
Okay? This is essential for learning and growth and improvement. This is what allows us to change. Uh, for example, somebody tell me what you want to be when you grew up. When you were a kid, what did you want to be? When you were, you were first grade, somebody said, what do you want to be when you grew up? What would you say? Fireman. Fireman? fireman. Still, I said fireman. Oh, fireman? Okay, fireman. Oh, good. Yeah, fireman. Good. What did you say? What did you want to be? A doctor. A doctor? Do you still want to be a doctor now? No. Do you still want to be a fireman? Yes. Do you? Excellent. What did you want to be? Baseball player. A baseball player? Do you still want to be a baseball player? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want? Oh, you want to be a princess? Is the other one I give. You want to be a princess? So, do you still want to be a princess now? The answer is I am a princess. What do you mean? Okay. Uh, uh, when I was a kid, if you asked me this question, what do you want to be when you grow up? First thing I would have said would have been Spider Man. That's why I thought you were going with that. Uh, but, but that didn't really pan out. When you really pin me down and said, no, Mike, what do you want to be? I would have said, I want for it to be an astronaut. Right? I want to be an astronaut. Go up space and float around, shoot aliens, wear diapers, do what astronauts do. They were diapers. You can't just let it go. Get the because it just. Anyway, the point is, I want to be an astronaut, right? Well, by the time I was a sophomore in high school, I figured out two things about being an astronaut. First one is, in order to be an astronaut, you have to be really, really good at math. Yeah, math and science. But but math was particularly one for me because the second thing I figured out by the time I was a sophomore in high school is that I stink at math. Absolutely my worst subject. Terrible math. You know those proficiency tests you take? Tell you what you're good and bad at? My scores come back L I, I, they come back LOL. I thought I had a one on one, but it was, just, it was just like, don't even try. Terrible math scores. And the thing is, well, when I went to college, I sat down with a college counselor and said, uh, I sat down because I went to Utah State, I sat down with Utah State college counselor, and this is no joke. I said, show me all the degrees you have that don't require a lot of math. And he laid them out on the table, this is before computers and the internet. Uh, laid them out on the table, there are a bunch of little sheets, and I literally picked my major, picked my degree from that list because I knew that I couldn't do a degree without a lot of math because I'm the bad at math guy. If you would ask me, that's what I said. Yep, my name is Mike Furman, I got brown hair, blue eyes, two arms, two legs, and I'm bad at math. That's me, I'm the bad at math guy. And the thing is, that was stupid, okay? And I wish somebody would come up to me and said, Mike, look, and smack it beside the head because that's what it would have taken, and said, Mike, look, if there is something about you that is keeping you from what you want, well then fix it, because you can. You're this human being who's self-aware, who can change things. The moment I came to accept that I was a bad at math guy, my dream of becoming an astronaut, died. Mm. I never became an astronaut, and I'm still bad at math, right? Mm -hmm. If there's something that's getting, see, because look at what I did there. I took my weaknesses and let my weaknesses determine what I would be. That is the wrong approach to life. We don't let our weaknesses determine our outcome. We let our passions, our hopes, our dreams determine what we become and then, or what we want to be, and then we get our weaknesses out of the way. That's the correct approach to life. That's the way to be successful. I wish somebody would have let me know that. Uh, if there's something about you that you feel you need to change, so then, then fix it. Kind of what I'm talking about with my buddies who didn't go to college because they said they weren't college material. Well, if you're not college material, then fix it. You ever heard this phrase before? Make it until you make it. Can we explain that? Tell me what it means. First time I heard it, I heard it explained this way. It said, look, if there's something that you want to become or something that you wish you were, you should pretend you are that thing. And if you pretend long enough, you get to point out pretending anymore. Does that really work? It doesn't work with everything, right? I couldn't pretend to be the starting point guard for Mount Crest High School, right? Went out in the court in my short shorts. Because <laughs> that's what we wore in my day. Because that's not going to happen, right? Some things, sure, you can't just pretend you're this thing. However, attributes, skill sets, things about yourself like that that you want to change, this works very well at. If you want to be a better public speaker, what do you got to do? You got to speak in public, right? You got to do it again and again and again. And the first few times you're going to be up there trying to act like you're a good public speaker, putting your hands in your pocket so we can see how bad you're there shaking and how terrified you are or whatever. But you do it enough times, you're going to get to the point where you pick up some good public speaking skills and you're not trying to act like a good public speaker, but you'll become one, if that makes sense. Conversation skills. Uh, if you want to be a better student, start acting like one. Okay? Come to class on time. Sit in the phone room. Listen. Take notes. Take the notes home and study. Your parents will freak out. Okay? But you do that for 30 days, you're going to get to a point where you're not trying to act like a good student anymore. You'll start picking up some good study habits. And your seniors, you still got your whole school year right now. I'd start practicing right now if you're worried about your study skills in college. Okay? Plenty of time to change. 
No reason why you can't fix things that need to be fixed. Fake thing, make it. Good way to do that. Okay, any questions about that? All right. Let's talk about perceptions of reality for a minute. Socrates. Anybody know who Socrates is? Ancient Greek philosopher, right? More told goes back when they were in style, not because he was going to a party. Uh, <laughs> Socrates said, now, by the way, before we get in, what, what color are the camels in this picture? So let me tell you, how many people see black camels? How many people see some other color of camel? What color are the camels? White. White? white. What? Black. You're right. They're camel color, right? What you're looking at here is an actual live shot of real camels. Okay, he's taken from like a hot air balloon looking straight down on the camel's backs. These are the camel's backs right here, these little white tannish things. Okay? And the black things are their shadows on the ground. Okay, your perspective, how you're looking at things. I gotta point that out, otherwise eventually, ten minutes from now, somebody will go, oh, and they won't for anything I said, right? <laughs> so, oh, I see it. Now, yeah. Okay. The reason why I had that, Socrates had this whole thing with shadows in a cave, that's why we chose that picture, which we're not gonna get into the whole shadows in a cave thing, you can look it up if you want to. But what Socrates essentially said was was he's talking about perception and reality. What Socrates said was, reality is irrelevant. Because people don't base decisions upon what reality is. People base their decisions and act upon what they think reality is. What he's essentially saying is, it doesn't matter really if you're a good employee or a bad employee. What matters is whether or not your boss thinks you are a good employee or a bad employee. You could be the greatest employee on the planet, but if your boss hates you, you're going to keep your job. And what you end up usually having, what you find in the job world, the business world, is you have two jobs. You have the job that you know you need to do to do well and get the job done, and then you have this whole other job, which is just convincing your boss you're doing a good job, which is using the form of paperwork. And they're both important, because if you do one bad, either one of them not well, you're going to end up losing your job one way or the other. Okay? Perceptions versus reality. Uh, another example, real quickly. Anybody ever been surfing? Anybody ever surfed before? You been surfing? Really? Yeah. Where'd you go surfing at? Hawaii. Hawaii? Were you pretty really good at it? Heck no. Hey, you know what? I, I, I admire you just for trying. Like, I, I really think that's amazing. I think it's amazing to surf because I will never go surfing. You will never get me in the water and go surfing and somebody tell me why. You hate water. Sharks. No. Sharks! <laughs> yeah. Because I know that if I go surfing, I'm going to eat my, I don't know how you survive. I'm going to eat my shark, right? I, and you can try to confuse me with the facts, tell me I'm far more likely to be struck by lightning, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm not. Because I'm never going to eat my shark because I'm never going surfing. The reason that I, now, well, yeah. The reason that I know I'm going to eat my shark is because, look, I've seen all the Jaws movies. Okay, see, I watch Shark Week every year. It comes on, come on Discovery Channel. I even saw, I even saw Deep Blue Sea. Have you seen that one? The Samuel Jackson. He's like not even in the water. The shark. Ah, no, thank you. What about Sharknado? Oh, it happens. <laughs> yeah, the Sharknado. That's taking it to a whole other level. <laughs> luckily, luckily, uh, oh, what did you hit that? Luckily for me, that, that's sharks. Uh, shark. Um, I live in Utah where there's no tornado, so that doesn't scare me. I'm okay with that. But, uh, but, but, um, what's that about Soul Surfer, right? Mm -hmm. That's not an inspirational movie to me. All I can, the only thing I can, I, I see Soul Surfer, I just want to go home and start sucking my thumb. <laughs> All I can say to her, though, it's like I watch the movie, it's like, the shark ate your arm! It's pooping it out in the ocean right now. Why are you out of your, anyway, I, I just, yeah. And the thing is, I know the facts. Hey, I know the truth about sharks. Billions and billions of people every year, every day are out in the ocean swimming around having a good time. And yet, on the whole planet, on average, we have 14 shark attacks or shark deaths a year. 14 people a year die from shark attacks, shark deaths, right? And yet, I lay awake at night thinking about it. And the problem is, because of my perceptions. Because even though there's only 14 of them, we hear about all of them in gory, gruesome detail splattered in blood red across the news, right? And, 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 it's, and it occupies our time. It's the same reason why people are scared of flying. Because every time there is the safest form of travel, but whenever there is a crash, we hear about it for months and months and months, right, about this wreck. Uh, and, our, and, and even though I know there's no shark, right, or even though I know I'm not going to eat by a shark, I'm terrified of sharks, so I'm, I'm terrified to go swimming in the ocean. And in fact, do you know sharks swim in freshwater rivers? They can swim about freshwater rivers. So now every time I'm in Hiram Dam or Willard Bay water skiing in the back of my head, I'm here in D minor. Because <laughs> 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 it could have swam and jumped over the you know, I don't know, whatever. Uh, and, and I know that, it's, that, that even though I know that's not the case, the fact I have to convince myself, it's okay, it's okay. Shakti's already proven his point. The fact I know what reality is, my perceptions are stronger from what I've seen in the news on TV. Uh, before you think it's just me and I'm crazy, let me ask you this question when you're driving your car, how do you know how fast you're going? And really, if I pin you down to it, what we'll find out is you have no idea how fast you're going. 
The only thing you know is what that needle says. And if it's right, good. And if it's wrong, good. Doesn't matter. You're still going to base your decisions upon what this needle tells you as far as braking, accelerating, whatever, until the cop pulls you over. This is your reality, even though it's just a perception that's being, that's being giving you feedback. Okay? When you get to college, they're going to take it one step further. They're going to say, how do you know anything is real? How do you know I'm even here? How do you know any of us are really here? Maybe you're just a brain in a petri dish. And your whole life has been somebody prodding with electrodes, making you think your life's going to happen to you, and really, you're just a brain. Matrix is based upon that, right? The point is, if your perceptions were lying to you, how would you know? Now, why are we talking about this? Because the real point to me is this. If perceptions are that powerful, they can make a normally sane person terrified of sharks or whatever. If perceptions are that strong, the real question becomes, <laughs> what's your perception of you? How do you see yourself? You've got to be really careful of things that you tell yourself because you listen to you. Right? <laughs> and in fact, if, 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 if you're the one telling yourself you're not good enough or you can't do something or something is not possible for you, You've just become your worst enemy. You need to be the person who's on your side. You need to be the one who tells yourself, it's okay, I can do this. If anybody can do it, I can do this. It's going to be okay. The setback happened, that's going to be all right because I'll be okay. You have to be the one who's on your side. If not, and what we're kind of talking about is self-talk, right? Make sure you tell yourself positive things, not negative things. And do whatever it takes. My little sister, way back when I, a long time ago, I still lived at home. And she was going to high school. She used to leave herself little post notes on the mirror. And they'd say things like, you are not bad. You have pretty hair. Your skin is nice. And I remember seeing him going, it's stupid. But it wasn't stupid. Because what she was trying to do was stop herself from doing that thing that everybody does where you wake up and look in the mirror and go, oh, I'm so fat. This shirt makes me look pale. Is that a zip? You know, or whatever. And you beat yourself up to the point to where you walk in the door and go, don't look at me, I'm hideous. You get to school. <laughs> if you saw me walking down the hallway like this, would you say hi to me? Maybe just to see what the freak is all about. No, but generally not, right? Because you've got this sour look on your face. And then see, nobody says hi to me. And that's because I'm so ugly. And I'm just a big... And it's not true at all. But it doesn't matter that it's not true because you think it is because you've convinced yourself something that is absolutely false is the truth. And you live like that long enough, pretty soon people start reacting and interacting with you based upon that. You need to tell yourself a loser, you're a loser enough times. What do you become? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Really? Think about that. You're telling me you can take this human being with all this amazing ability and potential and destroy all that just by telling them that they have them? Okay? Okay? It's this whole thing. Okay? What your perception of you is. And that's, that's a scary thought. Okay? Be very careful of the things you're telling yourself. You have to be the one who's on your side. We're kind of talking about attitude, right? Anybody heard the story of the four-minute mile? Okay? Roger Bannister, right? Uh, did somebody tell it to me? No. But... If you didn't know the story, basically up until 1955, everybody on this planet believed, you know, believed is a strong enough word. They knew that it was impossible for a man to run a mile in four minutes uh, because it had been medically and scientifically proven to be the case. Nobody said could run a mile in four minutes. It was humanly impossible to do. And then, well, until here he is, Roger Bannister, 1955, he ran a mile in nine, uh, three minutes, uh, 59 point something seconds. He broke four minute one. Which is really, really great for Roger Bannister, right? But that's not really the, the, the amazing thing to me. The amazing thing is what happened next. No, he didn't die. <laughs> what happened next was, this was the beginning, there were two, by the end of 1955, there had been three people in a mile in four minutes. And by the end of the following year, or, yeah, by the end of the following year, they were getting close to ten. Nowadays, it happens all the time. It's, I mean, it's still really hard to do. But when it happens, it's not even newsworthy. See, nobody believed, nobody had run a mile in four minutes because nobody believed it could be done. And the instant that somebody showed it could be done, oh, you can do that? Okay. And everybody started doing it. It's all up here. Okay, attitude. Things they told themselves, but they could and couldn't do. A more modern example that I like of this is Travis Pastrana. You may heard Travis Pastrana? What Travis Pastrana do not too long ago? Everybody said it was impossible. He's done a lot of things, but what was the things he did not about three, four years ago? There it is. Double backflip, right? Said it couldn't be done. Bam. Did it in the X game. Double backflip done. You do a search for Roger for, for double backflip right now. Travis Pastrana is about 10th or 11th on the list. They actually got stone wheels doing double backflips and stuff nowadays. It's not even that big a deal, even though up to that point, everybody thought it was impossible and couldn't be done. Okay. The thing I like about Travis Pastrana, if you watch his show, Nitro Circus, yeah, you uh, is that Travis Pastrana runs around with this, it's like he has this billboard sign on his forehead that says, I can. Because he thinks he can do anything, even when he can't. And when he can't, it's spectacular, right? But, when, but see, most of us, when we try something and fail, our first response is, see, I told you I couldn't do it. I knew it wasn't possible. 
Travis Pastrana, that thought never even enters his head. It's not that he can't do it. In his mind, it's just because my foot slipped off the peg, or my fly went in my face, or the zipper went down, or whatever. Next time I'm going to, okay. Next time I'm going to, okay. Next, and I'm not telling you this because I want you to run around like an idiot like Travis Pastrana. Okay, that's not the point. Okay? The reason I'm telling you this is because in life, your life, not somebody else's, in your life, there will be bad things that happen to you. He's going to give a minute. Everybody watch their stuff. Okay. In your life, there will be bad things that happen to you. Not somebody else. There is going to be bad things that happen, right? <laughs> People are going to lie to you. People are going to... Do we need to move on? Do we need to move the pictures? <laughs> People will lie to you. People will steal from you. People will fire you. Uh, there's going to be uh, jobs that get lost. There'll be flat tires. There'll be broken cars. I mean, there's going to be a lot of bad things that happen. And I'm going to tell you this because I'm trying to tell you life is terrible. I think life is great. I love that girl one. <laughs> Honestly, using this for me a lot of minutes, I have to like this. Uh, move on. But because the point is, is that in your life things will go wrong. But you think about that. Who people that are, think of people, some of you know, are successful, and then ask yourself, are they successful because nothing bad ever happened to them? They just got lucky and everything went their way, or are they successful because when things went wrong, they had that ability to bounce back. Okay, bouncing back. That's the key to success. Bill Gates went bankrupt like what, three times? Then he founded Microsoft, now he runs the planet. All right? I mean, bouncing back is what determines. I mean, you just flunked the test, what are you going to do now? You just flunked the class, what are you going to do now? You just got kicked out of school, what are you going to do now? That question, what are you going to do now, is the most important question you can ask yourself. When the bad things happen, okay? What, we're self aware, what is it that we're going to do next? And in fact, there was a guy by the name of Viktor Frankl who said oftentimes in life, maybe I heard of Viktor Frankl, he was a Holocaust survivor, right? He was a Jewish concentration camp, wrote a bunch of books, one was called Man's Search for Meaning. In that, he said, oftentimes, it's not what life, other people, or circumstances do to us that hurt us the most. Oftentimes, what hurts us the most is our response to those things. For example, when I was a kid, I had an old brother, I had an old brother, I got an old, maybe I got an old brother, who's here has got an old brother? They pick on you? Pick on you? My old brother was five years older than me, okay? Beat me mercilessly. All the, scarred me for life, right? Beat on me all the time. You couldn't even walk past me and do this when I wouldn't flinch, you know, or whatever, because my brother was just... Big. And when we, when we were getting fights, they'd be over like this fast. I'm not going to cry and be walking away laughing, because what was I going to do? He's five years older than me, right? When I was five, he was ten. When I was ten, he was fifteen, okay? And one day, I was, I was ten years old, I'm sitting at the dinner table, minding my own business, doing my homework, my older brother comes walking past with absolutely no reason at all. As he walks past, he goes... Back to the head. Mm. It, was, it, was, it was like 10 years of frustration just boiled up in one moment, in one moment, in a blind fit of rage. I reached for the first thing I could find, and I threw it at him. It was a jar of peaches. <laughs> and he ducked. Bzz, peaches and glue, juice, and glass all over the wall, right? Mom comes running in the room, and what did I say? I didn't say it quite this eloquently, but essentially what I tried to argue was, Mother, what we have here is a classic situation of stimulus and response. Therefore, the fault for the response lies not with the responder, but with he who caused the stimulus. Which basically came out as, we started it! Right? <laughs> Did my mom buy that? No. Okay. And there were beatings and groundings and all these things to fall. But now I was 10. All right? But people grow up, and they hang on to that same mentality, and they want to tell you all the reasons why the things that they're doing or about to do are somebody else's fault, or someone else's responsibility. Right? This is also, also Victor Frankl. This is a quote from Victor Frankl as well. Between stimulus and response, what he's talking about, where essentially, what he's essentially saying in this quote is that, look, we're human beings who are self-aware. And we always have a choice to choose how we're going to respond to things when they happen to us. Basically, they, they can duct tape you up and throw you in a box, and they still haven't taken away your freedom to decide how you're going to respond to being duct taped up and thrown in a box. Then you might say, okay, well, you know, what have I got to do? Yeah. Well, uh, I think it was Browning who was actually in prison in Texas and they'd thrown him in the hole back in the 30s when they could do that. He was out in the hot sun in the hole in Texas just dying in pain. And he said, you know, he realized he couldn't think of two things at the same time. So he thought about something else. He couldn't think about the pain. He started thinking about a new type of rifle he wanted to make. He eventually got out of the hole. Eventually got out of prison. He took his designs he'd made when he'd argue he had no freedom at all. Put him into practice and built him and basically a millionaire making these new Browning rifles or whatever. Uh, you always have a choice. Okay, was it my fault my brother smacked me upside the head? No. 
sometimes you get people who say, yeah, because you were born, and that's usually the oldest in the family that says that. But, but, but no, it wasn't my fault my brother Spike said that. It wasn't my fault the jar of peaches hit the wall. Absolutely. Okay, that was my choice. I could have let it go. If I had let it go, mm, my head would hurt for 30 seconds. Jerk, and I would go off my life, right? As, and I've been happily watching Knight Rider and Dukes of Hazzard that time, whatever. As it was, like I said, there were being around and bad things. Oftentimes, the things, the way we choose to respond to things becomes the worst, becomes far worse than whatever it was that happened to us. So uh, keep that in mind. We always, we always get to choose our response when things go wrong. We always have the ability to bounce back because that's something that people can't keep from us. Um, this, is a, this is an exercise that we do in a presentation only if I have time. Sometimes I have like two hour classes. Uh, I don't think we'll go over this right now, but it's basically we, we have them pick three roles that they play. Um, things like friend or son or daughter or whatever. Uh, and then they write down someone, they write that, they play that role for us. So they might put their best friend's name down or their parent's name down or whatever. And then in the end, we have them imagine that it's their 90th birthday and uh, each of these three people that they've written down or whatever, each of these individuals are going to stand up and give a tribute to them. What is it that you want them to say about you? The point is to get students thinking about what is it that they want their life to be about? What are you really about? Because you need to figure out what that is first before you start setting goals. Figure out what matters to you, and then you set goals that make that, that make sense. So that's kind of that exercise, but again, we'll kind of shorten that because just in the interest of time. Um, last thing we'll talk about real quickly is my old boss. Um, one of my favorite bosses had this philosophy in then some. He said this was the other secret to success in life. Too often we go through life trying to get away, find out how much we can get away with, right? What's the very bare minimum that we have to do before we get fired? What's the bare minimum I have to do to, to get a passing grade or whatever? Oftentimes that's the approach we take, that's the wrong approach. We should find out what's expected, do that, and then a little bit more. You're supposed to be there at 8 o'clock, be there at 10 to. You're supposed to write a three-page paper, write three and a half. If you're supposed to send flowers on Valentine's Day, send flowers and chocolates, right, or whatever. Okay. Seek, one secret, or another secret to success is, is always do what's required, and then some. And not a whole lot, but and then some. Uh, and that's kind of the, the main portion I want to talk to you today as far as um, life and success. Uh, again, some key points, right? You've got to go to college, go as soon as you can. Once you go, you've got to go to class. Uh, and then in life, remember, you, you have positive self-talk and that ability to bounce back because you're a human being who's self-aware and uh, nothing is impossible for you, especially you know, when you have your whole life ahead of you. I know you hear that a lot, but um, really it just takes effort and commitment and you can have whatever it is you need to. Let's talk about Stephen Tenniger for a minute. Does anybody know anything about Stephen Tenniger? You want me to do the school portion? <clears throat> it's optional. It's optional? Well, yeah. you say. I think we're good. Okay, we'll call it. I move in the school 